turn with me this morning to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, and uh, as we continue our study into this incredible book, Revelation chapter 2, and we're going to be reading from verses 1 to 7. And I do encourage you to go home and to read the book of Revelation. It's a wonderful, wonderful book. It might be a bit confusing at times with dragons with seven heads and ten crowns and various other things, but it's a wonderful, wonderful book. And if there's things there that one doesn't understand, make a note of it. Uh, perhaps ask me or wait until we get to that section one day and uh, we'd certainly, uh, uh, I'm sure you'll find it of great interest. There's a great blessing from the Lord in reading this book and taking it to heart. So I do encourage you to do so. Revelation chapter 2, reading from verse 1 to 7. <clears throat> to the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practice of the Nicotinians, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. It's come to prayer. Gracious and eternal God, we thank you, Lord, for the wonderful privilege again of being able to meet together before you to study your word. We ask and pray in your grace that you send your Holy Spirit and your presence within this building in a very powerful and a very wonderful way. May your Spirit move with great power in amongst the, up and down the, the aisle and amongst the pews. May you look into each and every one of our hearts. May you examine our hearts. May you take our hearts and take your word and impress your word upon our hearts and lives for eternal change to the glory of your name. Lord, may you speak into all of our hearts, speak into all of your li our lives as your Holy Spirit moves. And may your Holy Spirit move with great power, starting with my own heart here today and then into all of our hearts. Glorify your name for Jesus' sake. God's people say, Amen. Amen. Now this morning we turn back to our study in Revelation chapter 2. Last week was our introduction into this absolutely incredible chapter, a chapter which deals with the letters to the seven churches. Churches that existed at the time of John, whom our Lord Jesus used to pen these letters around the year AD 96, in the area of modern day Turkey today. Now, as I pointed out to you, although these seven churches existed then, the number seven prophetically is God's number of completion. Meaning that although the Lord Jesus wrote to seven literal churches, these letters are written to all of God's church as they are complete in every age of world history. The completeness of the church. So the complete church in the first century, the complete church in the second century, the complete church in the fourth century, the complete church in the 21st century. And they were written to lay down what God expects His church to be like. The criteria of Christ for His own church. And so this little church here this morning is flickering amongst those candelabra. When you look at that vision there in Revelation chapter 1 and Revelation chapter 2 and you see the candlesticks of God, our little church is right there. Meaning that these seven churches represent the typical type of church that stands before God throughout all the years of church history. And that, for example... One of these seven churches is a dead church, and there are dead churches today, aren't there? Another church is a missionary church, and you'll find that there are missionary churches in the world today who are totally caught up with the work of Christ. One of these churches is a church where their love for God grew cold. And there are churches today where their love for God has grown cold, and they exist simply by cold tradition and formal orthodoxy. But further, these churches also turn and they characterize different types of individual Christians. 
And that there are Christians whose love for God has grown cold. And there are other Christians who, as far as God is concerned, are absolutely dead. And that they do nothing for God at all. They get up on a Monday morning, they just amble through the day. And then they get up on a Tuesday morning and they amble through the day. And there is absolutely no fire and no passion for the things of God. And then there are other Christians who have a burning missionary zeal for God. They fire up. They want to get the gospel of Christ out. Every single opportunity that they have, they're witnessing their faith. They're telling others about the Lord Jesus Christ. They're seeking to spread the good news of salvation in Jesus everywhere. And then there are other Christians who are suffering for their faith. Just as there is a suffering church here in the book of Revelation. And so these seven churches here, although historic, real churches, have a tremendous and phenomenal impact as the church of Jesus Christ today. Or as we turn and we ask ourselves, what character and what qualities make up a church? And what Christ is actually saying to you and I individually today about our own lives here. But these churches, as we pointed out last week, go even further than that. In that they not only represent a particular church and a type of church, and they speak in reference to a type of Christian, but they each represent a chronology of the church in church history. And that, for example, the letters to the church in Ephesus is an example in history of the way the church was up to about A.D. 160. And so if you take a, a line in history, and you take the resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ, and you move 160 years into the future, the church in Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 to 7, pictures what the church was predominantly like during that period of historical time. And then each letter pictures the characteristics of the church in history. And so if we were to take uh, everything from the resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ and draw a straight line throughout history all the way through to 2021, or rather end up to the end and the return of Jesus Christ, and you take the seven churches and put the seven churches in that, you will see what the church of God has been like all the way through. And you'll see what the final church will be like in world history divided by seven. And so what we have here are relevant, pertinent, related, formidable, high-powered truths from God to every single one of us concerning our lives, the church, and the future of God's kingdom here in terms of the Christian, Christian world. And so I pray that God speaks into every one of our hearts and He takes His truth and He powers it into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Now last week we looked at the breakdown of this letter and we saw that there are seven aspects that God deals with in terms of each church. And that firstly, in each letter there is a correspondent who is addressed. Then the church, then the city, then the commendation, then the condemnation, then the command and then the counsel. And those seven points is the way that the Lord has constructed his his, the writing of each and every one of these seven letters by using those points. Now last week we picked up and we looked at the first one, the correspondent. And we saw that the correspondent is our Lord Jesus Christ. And that John is simply the scribe. John is simply the one picking up the quill and Jesus says, by the way, I'm writing to the church in Ephesus. This is what I want you to write. And John starts to scribe it. Secondly, we looked at the church. And we saw that this letter in Revelation chapter 2 verse 1 was written to the church in Ephesus. And that history tells us that this church was a very, very strong church spiritually. It had been founded by the apostles, and in particular by the apostle Paul. And therefore, it had been rooted in some incredible Bible teaching. Friends, you can only imagine, as I said last week, the Apostle Paul standing up in a church pulpit and preaching the Word of God. You've read the book of Romans and Corinthians. Can you imagine Paul preaching the book of Ephesians, a book he penned under the Holy Spirit, or the book of Corinthians, Sunday after Sunday, the most incredible Bible preacher the world has ever known. In fact, in Acts chapter 19, verse 10, we're told that the Apostle Paul preached 
from its pulpit for two years to literally ground that church in the Word of God. Sunday after Sunday, week by week, Paul stood up to preach the Word of God. We are told that the first minister was Timothy, a man that Paul often turned and called a son to him in the Lord. And so you can imagine how Timothy's messages and Timothy's way of preaching dovetailed with the Apostle Paul. And on top of that, the book of Acts tells us that they had visiting preachers like Apollos and Aquila, outstanding Christians, standing in their pulpit preaching. And then last week, we did a detailed study into the founding of this church in Acts chapter 19. Wow! Now, I've just given you a very, very brief overview here. And so I do encourage you to tune into, our, tune into last week's message, which will be posted today on, on YouTube. And listen to it again, and just get, just get that grounding into it. Now today, let's pick up on the city. In that here we have a letter written to the church in the city of Ephesus. Now, what was the city of Ephesus like? What was Ephesus like? What kind of city was Ephesus to which our Lord Jesus picks up a pen and writes a letter to his church there? What was the city like? Well, it was a fascinating city. It was a prominent city. And it was a hard city. In many ways, we could stand back this morning and we could compare it to Johannesburg. It wasn't easy to necessarily go out and live in the city of Ephesus. Think of a city. Think of Johannesburg. It's not easy. There's a whole lot of issues around, around living in a city, and it was no different then. When Paul went to Thessalonica, for example, Paul spent three weeks in the city of Thessalonica, and the entire city came to conversion. There was a mighty moving of the Spirit of God in three weeks. Paul was preaching Sunday by Sunday, week by week, for two solid years in Ephesus. His total time in Ephesus was three years, and it landed up with riots in the streets from the business community against Paul's preaching and against the Christian church in Ephesus. And it took, and he was there for three years. At the time of Paul and the Apostle John, Pergamon was the official capital of Asia Minor. But at, the, at that time, Ephesus was by far the largest city in that part of Turkey. A Roman writer went and called Ephesus Luminous Asia, or the Light of Asia. And it was. As a city, it was prominent for many, many reasons. First of all, Ephesus had the greatest harbour in Asia Minor. It was three miles from the sea up the Caister River. Three miles. And between Ephesus and the sea, there were a whole system of canals and dikes and different levels. So that ships could travel three miles up the Caista River, turn around and go back to sea. We mustn't sit back and think of Ephesus as some primitive little stone town. It was not. Dikes and canals and all the rest of it. It was also a very important place. Therefore, in terms of its harbour that we could sit back and perhaps call it the Durban or Cape Town of the ancient world. Not only that, but it had four main highways that led into Ephesus from the known Roman world at that time. Four massive freeways converging on that city, and on top of that, one of the greatest harbours with dikes and canals and different levels going up and down so that ships could move three miles up that river. There was dredging going on constantly, so that Ephesus came to be called the marketplace of Asia. It was the business district. It was the business hub. It was the Johannesburg of Asia. Ephesus, as a city, was also known for its loyal support of Rome. To the extent that Rome went and deemed in their senate that Ephesus was responsible enough to govern itself so that the Roman government, government went and granted Ephesus the right to be called a free city. Which meant that no Roman garrison was placed in Ephesus. There were no Roman soldiers in the city of Ephesus. Now that just did not happen in the Roman Empire. Rome, the Roman Empire was garrisoned by Roman troops throughout, keeping peace and keeping order throughout the empire but not in the city of Ephesus. It was also important as a city because it was also the center of the worship of Artemis, 
or Diana of the Ephesians, the greatest and most sacred goddess in the Roman world. Now there were seven wonders in the ancient world. There were the pyramids in Egypt. There were the hanging gardens in Babylon. There was the lighthouse in Alexandria. There was the temple in Jerusalem. And then there was the temple of, in Ephesus, which was one of them. The temple of Artemis. And that the temple of Diana in Ephesus was an unbelievable place. It was made up of glittering Persian marble. It was 425 feet long. Or in our terms, it was one and a half city blocks big. That's how big it was. One and a half city blocks. It was 260 feet wide. Hand-carved solid stone pillars standing 60 feet high. And there were 130 of them in the temple. 37 of those pillars were studded with jewels and gold. The Temple of Diana was also a museum in that anything that was found or considered to be beautiful in the ancient East was brought to the city of Ephesus and placed within the Temple of Diana. It was also a sanctuary for criminals so that anybody who was fleeing the law could run to the temple and they were immediately free from the law. No one could prosecute somebody who had gone and entered the Temple of Artemis. They were free and above the law, no matter the crime that they had gone and committed. Interestingly enough, they had a lot of criminals there because of it. Makes sense. And so consequently, they had to expand their boundaries so that anybody within 50 feet of the temple, as time went on, was considered to be safe from the law. As the years went on, the law went on to state that if you simply got into the district of Ephesus, you were now safe. And so whoever was hunting down a criminal, the moment that criminal fled into Ephesus, they could not touch them. And so you can imagine, any criminal for miles literally went and flocked to the place. No one wanted to be crucified by the Romans called for a crime. No one wanted to land up in a Roman prison or a Roman dungeon. And so the best thing you did is you packed your bags and you ran, no matter your crime, as fast as you could to the city of Ephesus. To crown it all, the temple of Artemis or Diana also became known as the Bank of the Mediterranean. Yeah. In that the inner sanctuary of the temple became like the reserve bank of that world, only filled with criminals. The temple was also the place of big business. In that they had shops where they sold everything, including their main business, little gods. So that you could go there and you could buy a little god that you could just hang on your mantelpiece. There was the god on your mantelpiece. You could buy other gods and you could hang them around your neck on a lovely silver or gold chain. Or you could go and buy a little god and hang it on the dashboard of your chariot while you roared around town. And they had images of Diana for everything. If you wanted business prosperity in, at that time in life, you could go into the temple of Artemis and you could buy a certain shaped little goddess of Diana just to have business prosperity. If you wanted health, you could go into the temple of Artemis and buy a certain goddess in its shape and that one produced health for you. Maybe you wanted an improvement in your relationships and so you went into the temple of Artemis and you went and bought a certain goddess just for, for relationships. And they had thousands and thousands of priests working within the temple and in its area around it because it had huge gardens around the temple of Artemis. And this is why when Paul started to preach and he stood up and he spoke about salvation in Jesus Christ, it caused an incredible amount of trouble. Look at Acts 19 verse 23 to 28. It says in this in Acts 19 verse 23, about this time, there arose a great disturbance about the way. The way? Salvation in Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to God the Father but through me. Verse 24. A silversmith named Demetrius, who made silver shrines of Artemis or Diana, brought in no little business for the craftsmen. He called them together along with the workmen and related trades and said, Men! You know and will receive a good income from this business. And you see and hear how this fellow Paul has
has convinced and led astray large numbers of people. Interesting, large numbers. Here in Ephesus and practically the whole province of Asia. He says that man-made gods are not gods at all. Verse 27. There is a danger. Not only that our trade will lose its good name. But also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited. And the goddess herself, who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world, will be robbed of her divine majesty. When they heard this, they were furious and began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! Soon the whole city was in an uproar. Wow! In regards to the worship of Artemis, or Diana, History tells us that it was a worship of temple prostitution, sexual immorality, <coughs> mysticism, and witchcraft. So witchcraft was something that was absolutely rife. It was a giant orgy, and it was very popular. All the businessmen used to meet there at the temple. They had temple prostitutes, there was served food, there was drinking, there was partying, and it went on day after day, week after week in Artemis. And this was the city of Ephesus. And squashed somewhere in the middle of all of this was a little group of people who loved the Lord Jesus Christ right there in Satan's backyard. Wow. Right there. And it's no different today, is it? Little groups of Christians scattered increasingly in a godless world. The godlessness of our world is multiplying and increasing phenomenally. Prostitution and pornography is right. Immorality and collapsing morals and materialism. Criminality is right. Where do you turn? There seems to be more and more criminals. They seem to be growing and, and, and abounding and seem to be safe. And it's the same world that we're living in. We just do it on a larger scale. And perhaps have greater ability to do it because of the internet. The difference is, is that at that time, Christianity went and made such an impact on society that it threw, threw the whole economic climate into complete and utter chaos. Idle sales fell. Religious manufacturers went literally out of business. Revival broke out. And the Church of Jesus Christ started to grow in a way that had never grown before. Something that is not happening today. Not on that scale. In fact, the love of Jesus grew to such a degree that in Acts chapter 19, verse 19 and 20, it says of Ephesus, if you look there, a number who had practiced sorcery, that's magic, brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. And when they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas, which was a lot of money in those days. In this way, the word of the Lord spread rapidly and grew in power. Wow. It was a whole new thing. And here we have a letter sent by Jesus to this group of Christians. Now, it is the character of each letter that our Lord Jesus, after identifying the church, and after identifying the city, commends them before He corrects them. Isn't that right? Jesus commends the church before He corrects them. Wow! Look at Revelation chapter 2, verse 2 and 3 with me. When we find Jesus' commendation to them, Jesus turns and says, I know your deeds, your hard work, your perseverance. That's good. Jesus says, I know what you're doing, Ephesus. I know. And you're doing some great, great things. Now, I don't know about you, but that gives me incredible and phenomenal comfort that my Lord Jesus, my Lord Jesus, knows what I'm doing for Him. He knows every thought, every word, every action, every deed. He knows everything about it. He knows my heart motivations. He knows my desires for the kingdom. He knows all of that about me. That none of us here are lone rangers somewhere out there on the plane or the steppy of life in this world. But absolutely everything we do for God, Jesus is taking note of from heaven. 
Everything I do, he writes down. Mark did this, Mark did that, Mark did this. He's writing down everything you are doing in your life for the kingdom of Christ. Every thought, every word, every action, every deed in your life. How does that make you feel this morning about the Christ who is evaluating what you are doing and how you are living before him personally? And in Revelation chapter 2 verse 2, Jesus goes on to name the works that they were doing. He says, I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men. That you have tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not. You found them false. You have persevered. You have endured hardship for my name. And you have not grown weary. Wow. I know your works, says Jesus Christ. And so Jesus commends them, firstly as a church and as Christians, for their labor and their service to Him. Wow! Now that word deeds there in verse 2, do you see the word deeds there? It's the Greek word karpos, which describes a person's labor to the point of utter exhaustion. Utter exhaustion. And so what we have here then is the type of labor the type of toil, the type of service for Jesus in life that takes the whole person. It takes every muscle, every muscle of your life to the point of collapse. Do you see the picture? Total exhaustion. Total exhaustion. Well, this was the type of labor that Jesus Christ commends his church for. And that the Christian labor or service for God that will bring the compliment and the reward and the blessing of God upon their own lives will not come upon the person who is not prepared to sweat it out for God. It's not a case of doing something half-heartedly or something not at all, something just perhaps at the end of one's life and expecting a massive compliment from the Lord. It's not easy come, easy go. It will not come upon those who are not prepared to put in maximum effort for God. And so let us as Christians listening here today, rise up, let's rise up and not settle for second best in our service for Jesus Christ in our own daily lives. As though our service for Jesus is a sort of add-on, an attack on at the end of our life or day. That's meaningless. And that when we one day stand before Jesus Christ, and He turns and He looks at your life individually and mine, and He evaluates us, in terms of our entire service in the life that God has given you and I to live, every minute of every day of every hour, He doesn't want to evaluate a service that wouldn't exhaust a butterfly. In that, remember, everything we do for God in life, Everything that you do for God is not done because you have to do it. It's not done because you've got a responsibility to the church or a responsibility to somebody else in life or because you feel you have to do it or you've got to go out to impress others. But it is done for God's glory and for your personal reward at your heavenly prize giving service and therefore for your eternity. Everything we do is done for the glory of God. All of our life, all of our breath is for the glory of God. And one day every one of us will be individually called to stand before the great throne of Christ. Glittering an unapproachable light with an emerald green rainbow over that throne. Surrounded by the crystal sea. Thousands upon thousands, 10,000 angels upon 10,000. And every single Christian that you've ever known in life will be standing there. Every Christian throughout eternity will stand there. Even the godless will be separated on the one side because judgment will begin with the house of God and every single one of us will be called forward and evaluated in life in terms of our duty for Christ. And then we'll be called forward for a prize giving service. And if we, some of us will get a prize and some of us will not. 
everything is for eternity. For Jesus, the Son of God, is going to evaluate your life in terms of your service for Him. As it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one will receive what is due to Him for the things done in the body, whether good or bad. And so the Christian is to spend his or her life giving it all for God and not hanging on to it. It's not your life to hang on to. You see, there is no case of you and I getting the fruit of the harvest, the blessing of God poured out in our lives, the reward of Jesus Christ for a life well lived, if we do not get our hands dirty for the kingdom of God. And your hands are only dirty for the kingdom if your heart is right. Your heart. Jesus is observing your life today. He is observing the motivations behind your heart in what you do for Him. And so the question is not what you did for Christ 30 years ago, but it's what you did for Him today. It's no good standing before the Lord in His throne one day as the whole of heaven stops to listen and one's heart is palpating in one's chest and to turn around to God and say, I did this and that. And the Lord says, I know what you did 30 years ago, but what have you done for me today? Are you from your heart in purity for the glory of God's name working and laboring and toiling in sweat by your deeds, Revelation 2 verse 2, to the point of utter exhaustion. Utter exhaustion. Not your exhaustion, God's exhaustion. For this is what Christ, our Jesus, commends these Christians, this church in Ephesus 4. In that they were working and reaching out actively for the kingdom of God. You say, well, what can I do for the kingdom? Reach out. Reach out for the kingdom. Whatever function you do in life, use that function to reach out. If you see a need in the church, reach out. They weren't a church inactive. They got involved. They saw a need. And they did it for the glory of God. The glory of Christ. Do you know what? They were loving it. They were loving doing it minute by minute. All because you see, when your heart is right, your service for Christ is the greatest thrill in the world to you. Do I hear an amen? When your heart is not right, your service for Christ is a drudgery in life and it pulls you down. And so Jesus, in verse 2, commends them not only for their hard work, but also secondly for their perseverance. Now, do you see that word perseverance there in verse 2? Some of our Bibles, it's translated patience, patience. Well, it's actually the Greek word supermova. Supermova, which means steadfast adherence. I don't know why they don't translate it steadfast adherence. It's what it is, steadfast adherence. Now, the ancient Greek for that word gives us the picture that as you live your Christian life, you are suffering. You're going through trial and difficulty. The going as a Christian is rough. It's hard for you. You're tired. You're worn out. You get up on a Monday night or a Sunday morning and you're tired. But with a smile, a smile to God's glory, you hang in there. You hang in there. You keep going like an athlete running at the comrades for gold. All you see in front of you, right down that track is that gold medal. You persevere. You carry on running. You strive to the glory of God. It's not the idea of Lord. 
What I'm doing for you as a Christian is a drag. I've had it. I'm exasperated. Come and get me out of this, God. I don't want to do this anymore for you. That's all. I've had enough. It's rather the idea of keeping on before God in life and saying, it's tough, God. It's tough. But putting my feelings aside, I love you, Lord Jesus. I love you. And I will keep on, Revelation chapter 2, verse 2, persevering and steadfast endurance for you as my God and Savior. You see, it's so easy to give up in life. That's what the world does. To say, Lord Jesus, I can for this or that reason not serve you anymore. And just turn it off. But you see, in God's sight, God does not take your service. Revelation chapter 2 verse 2. Your deeds, or in Greek, karpos, for Him, very seriously. If it doesn't involve perseverance to God's standards of exhaustion. God's standards of exhaustion. You say, I'm exhausted. God says, it's not my standard. Move on. Get going. This little church was given a hard time. And yet every single Christian stood fast. They worked hard from their hearts. They never gave up to exhaustion. Carbos. And God commended them for it. And then he commends them for their suppression of evil. Wow. Look at verse 2, Revelation chapter 2. Jesus says, I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men. Wow. I know you can't tolerate wicked men. Do you know that these Christians in this church couldn't tolerate those who were evil? They couldn't tolerate sin. They would not accept it. Instead, they held to a high and holy standard of behavior. When there, wicked, when there was wickedness, they went and dealt with it. Right was right and wrong was wrong. Not according to the standards of the world, but according to the standards of the word of the living God. Where they were, those of the church, they didn't hold, they didn't hold to the standards of Christ. They weren't tolerated. And you know that they were simply following the advice and the words of the Apostle Paul in his instructions to them. In that after Paul had preached for three years as their pastor, building them up in the word and the knowledge of the word of God, before he left them, he turned to them. Look at Acts chapter 20 verse 28 to 31. And Paul said to them, Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit made you overseers. The flock was the Ephesian church. Every minister is an overseer. You do the work and the minister oversees. Be shepherds of the church of God which he brought by his own blood. Watch this. I know that after I leave, what? Savage wolves will come in among you and not spare the flock. Even from your own number, what? Men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning you night and day with what? Tears. Wow. You see, Satan wants to destroy a Christian church's testimony. That's his goal. Break the testimony of a church. And the best way to do that is to infiltrate godless people into a congregation, into a church, into a leadership. People who have their own goals in mind, rather than the things of Jesus Christ. It's what I want, it's what I feel, it's what I think, it's what I desire. Not the kingdom. And this congregation, as every congregation should be, received God's favor because of it. They were sensitive to sin. They wouldn't tolerate it. They were sensitive to spiritual and to moral evil in life. 
And our Lord Jesus here turns and he commends them for their spiritual discernment in life. Now as we draw this message to a close this morning, can I challenge you in your own heart to take your stand today for Christ? Wherever Christ has put you to serve, whatever function you're in in life, at work, at home, with your children, your, your, your relationships, for Jesus said in Revelation 2 verse 2, I know your deeds, your hard work and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men. I know, I know, I know Jesus is watching you. And one day every single one of us will be called by God to give an accounting to Him for the way that we have gone and lived. For the way that we have thought. For the way that we have behaved. For the way that we have tolerated evil. And so as one church father of the past has stated that for you and I to live well in this world, we need to often be thinking of our eternity. One of the greatest things in life, now just think about this, is to receive the commendation of Christ. To receive the commendation of Christ. To receive and hear the words, well done. Thank you. May I challenge you today to take that stand this morning. To rise up, to rise up, to rise up. And to live according to the high and holy standard of behavior. A behavior of eternity. To hold to that which is right. And to reject that in life which is wrong before God and His word. Not what is wrong according to the standards and the precepts of the world around us, but what is wrong according to the righteousness of Jesus Christ as penned in the pages of the Bible. And therefore, as a Christian, to not live according to the standards of the world, but according to the standards of the living word of Christ. And in all your labor, in all your toil, in all your service for Jesus, Put in maximum effort to the point of utter exhaustion so that God turns to you and says, well done. Then you will hear the commendation of Christ upon the life that you have lived on this earth. Shooting and lighting up the morning sun lit, lit heaven for your very soul like a bolt of lightning from God. For it is. May God bless you as you seek to serve Him this coming week. Let's bow our heads and pray for the King. <clears throat> Perhaps God has touched your heart this morning. Maybe it's in terms of your behavior, in terms of your deeds. In terms of your hard work for the kingdom of Christ. In terms of your perseverance. In terms of your toleration of evil. Which surrounds us in our world today. For Jesus says, I know. I know. I know. Jesus is watching you. I want you to speak to Christ this morning. About taking that stand. About rising up for the kingdom. In your life. Righteous Heavenly Father, you have called us to be a people this morning who rise up and stand by what is righteous who rise up and take a stand for you according to what is right in your word, not according to the standards and the policies of a changing godless world, not according to what the world says is right or the world says is wrong, but according to what your word says is right and your word says is wrong. 
Help us to take that stand today. Not just to know it and to profess it. But to live it. To the glory of Jesus Christ. May the greatest desire and the passion of our hearts be to hear the commendation of Christ upon a life lived. To stand before you, Lord, and to have lived a life of 50 years, 40 years, 30 years, 100 years. And for there to be no commendation is a life wasted. But to stand before you one day and to hear the commendation of Christ, well done, should be the greatest motivation and desire from the moment we open our eyes in the morning and we take the first breath of the day. Motivate us, Lord, by your Holy Spirit. May we rise up, each and every one of us, and live to the glory of Jesus Christ. And God's people in Jesus' name say, Amen. Amen.